As an alternate historian, I try to predict history and its workings to see how history could have been different, and I frankly do try my best. But truth is stranger than fiction, and reality is not always predictable and logical. As you read history, you find so many near misses and chances that no one would have seen coming. So in honor of how random and strange life is, I thought I would make a video about the top 10 events in history that I, as an alternate historian, would never have been able to predict. Finally, this is purely from my perspective. I'm a different person from you, so I'm going to see the world differently from you. Remember, this is the internet and we all have our own perspectives. However, I have a YouTube channel, which means my opinion is demonstratively better than yours. Number 10. That the Romans invade Britain. This one is so unnecessary and counterintuitive. The Roman Empire was definitely a Mediterranean empire. Almost all of its provinces hugged that sea, and its wealthy urbanized heartland was entirely based around it, with only the frontier regions further north. The communication network that kept the empire together was the Mediterranean. The Romans were not a navigatory people, they didn't leave the safe shores of the Mediterranean much. Thus, it makes absolutely no sense that the Romans would go out of their way to conquer a small island in the North Atlantic. Frankly, Britain was much more trouble than it was worth. The island was lightly populated, the native population was aggressive and rebellious, and it was far removed from the rest of the empire. Britain needed three legions to hold the natives down, and protect its shores from raiders from both Scotland, Ireland, and later from Germany and Scandinavia. For a comparison, the much wealthier, populated, and stable province of Spain only needed one legion. The only saving grace of the island was that it had a few good minerals, like tin, but besides that, the islands gave very little to the empire. The reason the Romans invaded Britain was that Emperor Claudius, to solidify his power at home, needed a foreign victory, and Germany and Persia being too hard, chose Britain. This got the Romans stuck in Britain for the next 400 years. Frankly, this would puzzle me simply due to its randomness. Why would the Romans go out of their way to do this? If you're interested in the more plausible world in which the Romans never invaded Britain, the link to that alternate history video is in the description. Number 9, that China would remain a united country. So there is a general pattern in history. There tends to be a large singular empire, then that empire breaks up. The successor states try to model themselves off the original empire, and this forges a civilization. We saw this with the Roman Empire in Europe, the Maurians in India, and the Umayyads and Abbasids in Islam. The issue with China is that the original empire never had the decency to die. The China we see today is the descendant states of the Han and Qin dynasties founded more than 2,000 years ago. Over the thousands of years, Chinese civilization has been able to remain united as a single unitary, although diverse, culture that hasn't strayed too far from its roots. This is truly astonishing. China proper is a region larger than the United States or European Union, and even the populated one-third of China inhabited by the Han Chinese is still a vast region. Different climates, mountains, and regional cultures get in the way of Chinese unity, but it has been accomplished nonetheless. If I had to predict this, I would have thought China would have turned out something like this map. Since I need to keep this video a watchable length, I won't describe it in great detail, but that's what the map's for. If you want a closer look, you should probably pause this video now. I think the reasons this didn't happen are a couplefold. The geography of China is centered around three big rivers, which promotes unity. Also, the Mandarin bureaucrat class were centrally located and didn't have separatist local loyalties and this allowed them to maintain unity among all the provinces. Just compare it to Europe, where the local lords had their own castles and fiefs to split off with. Rice agriculture is also much more stable than wheat, meaning the state grew wealthier off it and was thus more stable. Finally, China's barbarians were almost entirely nomads, which had far less numbers than the barbarians who took over the Roman Empire, who were farmers. This meant that they had much less of an effect than the barbarians did in, say, Europe. Number 8. Scandinavia never had colonial empires. These are some maps of the combined colonial empires of some Western European nations. Pretty impressive, right? But what Western European nations aren't you noticing? Scandinavia is almost entirely left out. Don't get me wrong, Scandinavian nations had a couple colonies, like Delaware and Ghana, but these tend to die out quickly. It's not like Scandinavia wasn't aggressive in the Age of Exploration. Danish explorers did a lot of work in India and Africa, and the Swedes fought amazing war after amazing war in continental Europe. Sweden and Norway aren't in the North European plane, which means they can pull a Britain and invest in their navies instead of armies, and build a massive colonial empire that way, since they wouldn't have to put all their revenues into land armies, and it's not a size thing. 
because a lot of Scandinavian countries are larger than colonial empires like Portugal, Belgium, or the Netherlands. I honestly can't explain this one using any long-term trends. Literally everyone else in the region had colonial empires. I think it's simply a story of uninterested leadership. The Scandinavian monarchs are simply too involved in continental politics or untalented enough to make large colonial empires. Number 7, the Italians being so militarily weak. I feel like a couple of you probably saw this one coming. The Italians were the best soldiers in the world during the Roman Empire. The Romans won almost every war and were known for their bravery and tactical brilliance. Flash forward 2,000 years and the Italians are losing miserably to the British outnumbered 3 to 1. This Italian military incompetence actually goes back pretty far. The furthest I can push it is actually in the late Roman Empire itself, in which the Italians themselves scorned warfare while the armies were raised in the provinces like France, Turkey, and the Balkans. I'm not entirely sure why this happened. After the Roman Empire, it could be because of the Gothic Wars, which ravaged Italy, killing vast amounts of people for decades on end. But the Russians take that kind of beating every week and still remain aggressive. The best reasons I can come up with is that in the Middle Ages, southern Italy was always a downtrodden colonial possession of someone, meaning it never built up a warrior culture, and the middle of Italy was run by the Pope. The north of Italy was run by bishops for the most part and whose power turned over to the towns in cities like Venice and Milan. These never had a warrior class, like the knights in the rest of Europe, thus not getting a martial culture. Very surprising considering Italy's neighbors. Spain has its Terchios, France, Napoleon, England, the Long Bowman, Germany, the Blitzkrieg, and so forth. But Italy, nothing. Number six, that Latin America turned out so poorly. Is Latin America part of the West? This is a question a lot of us probably don't think about, but we all have opinions that we like to argue. However, the fact that we even have to ask this question shows something very interesting. On paper, Latin America should perfectly be part of the West. It's Christian, it has a large white population, and it was colonized in its culture as mainly a byproduct of Spain. However, in America at least, Latin America is definitely viewed as part of the Third World and is looked down upon. This brings up a very interesting point. Why did Latin America turn out so poorly, well, the rest of the West so well? Latin America is the only part of the West that never industrialized, for example. Even Russia, which treats its people terribly on an individual level, has been able to rise to world domination based off its sheer size. The reasons Latin America turned out so badly while well, nations like the United States and Canada, for example, turned out so well are complicated and many-fold, which is why I have an entire video series basically devoted to them. Watch my What If America Was a Third World Country to see me break down Latin American poverty, but the basic reasons are many-fold. The main reason is that the Spanish government were jerks. They broke the population into a racial caste system, gave the native people, even the settlers, no self-governance from Madrid, made the economy dependent on Madrid through government monopolies of business, exported all the wealth of resources back to Spain without leaving any for the native economy, had the Inquisition destroy all free thought, and divided the land into massive, nearly medieval encomiendas, estates, ruled by lords. So the Spanish basically did everything they could to make Latin America more medieval than the Middle Ages and dependent on them. Still, if I were the one predicting things, Mexico with its head start of a hundred years and larger population would be a major competitor with America, and Argentina a titan of the southern hemisphere. Which actually brings me to my next topic pretty roundly. Number 5. That Brazil's not a superpower. Seriously, Brazil, stop disappointing me. Those of you who have seen my What If Brazil Was a Superpower video have already heard this rant, but seriously, everything was in Brazil's favor. It's massive, larger than the continental United States. It has some of the most fertile soil on Earth, a massive coastline, and huge deposits of resources. Now here we are, and has an economy smaller than France, and is widely known for its corruption. It has 200 million people, but at the same time manages a fairly low population density due to the sheer size of the country and it has some of the richest resources on Earth, yet it still manages to be a fairly poor nation. So what went wrong? A couple of things. You can't blame the Spanish Empire, which didn't rule Brazil. The Portuguese did. The Portuguese weren't the abusive alcoholic helicopter parents the Spanish were. The only negative contributions they made were banning printing presses in the colonies, which lowered education and industry in the long run. Also, there were strict royal monopolies on the diamond mines. But in general, the Portuguese let the Brazilians do whatever they wanted, which is what worked out so well in British North America. 
The main reasons I can come up with are climactic. The tropical climate meant that slavery and massive mines that were slave-based were simply the easiest way to make money. Brazil was a purely slave economy simply because that made so much money that there wasn't any point in doing anything else. Since it was just a slave economy, it never progressed to a more advanced capitalist system. Brazil is actually a lot like the Confederacy, which had slaves, honor, and cotton, but precious little anything else. I once read that if you look at Brazil and America, if you only look at the Deep South and the boom towns and cowboys of the West, you'll see the same country. But when you look at the cities like New York or the small homesteaders of Nebraska, you realize where the difference is. So I'm sorry, Brazil. I may have been too harsh on you by saying you were in a perfect geographic spot before. Number four, that the natives were completely conquered in the Americas. The Americas are a massive region. They're larger than Africa, Europe, and Indonesia combined. However, when you look at this region today, we find the culture is almost entirely European. You can go from Tierra del Fuego to the north shore of Alaska, just speaking English and Spanish, languages that didn't even occupy the entirety of their puny island and peninsula 500 years ago. There are areas of significant native blood, like Paraguay, Peru, or Mexico, but the natives are almost always the peasant culture that isn't given much respect. Out of the major native cultures, none have been unconquered by the whites. This is surprising given the history of the region. If you looked at the Americas in 1492, you would find an area housing 80 million people, with massive monuments and advanced civilizations. You'd find it very hard to believe that in 400 years, not a single one of these native civilizations would remain. The Americas are simply so fast that this is frankly astonishing on the part of the Europeans. I'd have predicted some of the native cultures would have been conquered, but not all of them. The Inca, for example. They were simply so far away from Europe and were so large and advanced, being located in defensive mountains, it seems practically ridiculous that the Europeans conquered them. And frankly, it is. I'd like to introduce a brief slow clap in honor of Pizarro's 160 men who conquered the Inca Empire. You're still a terrible human being, but at least you have serious balls. Or I would have at least expected at least one of the 50 states of America to be majority Native American. I would have expected at least one tribal people to become allies with the whites and become their sepoys in exchange for survival. But the whites backstabbed the natives before this could happen. I would have expected at least one Native kingdom to have adapted to European technologies like the Japanese did, but that didn't happen either. This is probably for a couple reasons. Firstly, the whites were probably more brutal than I would have expected, with them not honoring treaties that would have given the natives time to, and opportunities to survive. Also, the natives never had amazing leadership. There was never a native Genghis Khan or Alexander to drive back the white man. Also, the conquistadors were incredibly brave, aggressive, cunning, and lucky, and so were able to pull off a ridiculous list of initial victories. Number three, India and Southeast Asia being so politically weak. India is a 4,000-year-old civilization that has developed advanced science, art, literature, world-famous religions, and has reached a height in almost every cultural field. However, Indian civilization is one major weakness, military and geopolitical. No Indian empire has ever left India, and out of the 22 invasions of India, 19 have succeeded. For a region with one-fifth of the world's population, a number that used to be higher, this isn't that impressive. Much of Indian history has been spent being conquered by a foreign group of nomads. Indian armies have at periods been a full thousand years behind surrounding areas, and have been primitive strategically. This is also the case in Southeast Asia. No Southeast Asian empire has waged great influence outside the region's borders. No offense, Southeast Asia is so indecisive to the general flow of history that most historians just skip it altogether. Most of the region is seen as a spectrum between India and China. If it were up to me, there would be at least one Indian Roman Empire, which had been able to forge an empire stretching to Baghdad, or a naval Bengali state that would conquer Indonesia and Malaysia. I would have expected Vietnam to invade southern China during some dynastic collapse, or Java to colonize Australia. It's hard to say why this is. This area is so very populated and societally and culturally advanced that you would expect it to have many large expansionist empires. 
I've heard a couple explanations. There's a disease explanation. This area is infected with a large amount of diseases, especially diseases found in the rice paddies that the peasants spend all day in, which weaken the peasants physically. But on the other hand, China has churned out many amazing troops and generals, and parts of it are very hot in rice space. But you could also make the argument that the parts of China that add militarily are the north. There's also caste, which splits the warrior caste off and prevents military talent from being drawn from the rest of the population, also making politics only the care of the warrior caste, while the peasants were more invested in religion. It could also be that India is a theocracy that doesn't have a large warrior ethos. However, whatever cultural factors explain India don't exist for Southeast Asia. To be way too honest and broad, you can draw a general latitudinal line around the subtropics that tend to be conquered and militarily weak, but that doesn't seem that convincing, and there are too many wrong examples to really believe this. To be even more honest, I just don't know, and I'll stop before I get a one-way ticket to the Victorian age. Number 2. That Islam Becomes a World Civilization Let's be real here, the Arabs that conquered the empire in the early years of Islam were a nomadic tribe, like the Mongols or the Huns. They were mounted archers that rode circles around civilized pikemen, they lived a nomadic lifestyle in tents, they had really nice horses, etc. Then you'd expect the Arabs to just assimilate into the native cultures like every other nomadic people ever, right? But no. Look, 1,500 years later, and the civilization the Arabs founded stretches from Morocco to Indonesia, and has hundreds of millions of members. Islam and Arab culture in general is massive, and shows no signs of going away. Having the Arab invasions at all wouldn't have surprised me. Plenty of nomadic peoples came out of the Arabian desert and conquered civilized peoples. Just look at the Babylonians, Jews, Syrians, or Akkadians. The issue with most of these is that they either assimilated or weren't really big enough to matter politically. Here the Arabs came and made millions of people who used to think of themselves as Syrians or Egyptians or Punics or Greeks or whatever into Arabs. The Arabs didn't even try hard at the start. Anyone who converted to Islam would be flogged, since it would reduce the tax rate for the non-Muslim poll tax, and the Arabs purposely settled in cities away from the native population to keep away from them. This is how we got all sorts of cities like Basra, Kairouan, and Cairo. Also, these areas already had an axial age religion, whether it be Christianity or Zoroastrianism. So one wouldn't expect a religious vacuum, but apparently Islam was attractive enough a religion to pull people away from their previous axial age religions. Why did this happen? There are a couple reasons. Firstly, the Arab men had a massive birth rate. A lot of the conquerors had enormous harems, and those children grew up thinking of themselves as Arabs. Secondly, the Muslims were pretty tolerant and good rulers, and so the culture seemed attractive, and over time, converting to Islam resulted in a lower tax rate, and the language one needed to understand Islam in was Arabic, thus dragging the people into Arabic culture. Thirdly, in a lot of the regions that became culturally Arabic, there was no strong native culture. The time before conquest was so distant that it was hardly remembered, and few identified with their Greek and Persian overlords so there was no strong central culture to resist the Arabs with. Number 1. The Rise of the West and the Great Acceleration If aliens were to visit the Earth, this is what would puzzle them the most. The world seemed to have pretty stable progress until around 500 years ago. A person from the Middle Ages wouldn't have any trouble working their way through the Roman Empire, or even frankly figuring out a Bronze Age village once they got over the language issues. The same basic skill sets and tools would be in place. However, a person from today would have enormous issues in the Middle Ages. We have none of the same skill sets and the same tool usages. Frankly, a person today would have troubles even 200 or maybe even 100 years ago. This is because the world has gone through a rapid and insane transition over the last 500 years. Think of the technological advance that has taken place over just the last 15 years. Then think of how we've spent millions of years as hunter-gatherers, and how we've spent 5,000 in the Bronze Age, or the Middle Ages were a thousand years long. Then think of how we went from cavalry to nuclear bombs and tanks in 30 years. The truth is that for the most part, this process was only done by one region on Earth, the Western nations. The rest of the world lagged behind and it was eventually conquered as the West smashed ahead, colonized the world, and imposed its culture. The only nations that were able to resist were those that imitated the West. 
This process was very strange, look at the general direction the rest of the world was going in. Let me explain. In the 12th century, everyone was doing pretty well. This was the golden age of India, China, and Islam. In the West, some think of this as the Dark Ages. They're mistaken. This is called the High Middle Ages and was the era of cathedrals and castles, known for brilliance and growth in every field. Then over the 13th and 14th centuries, due to climate change, the Mongols killing millions, the Black Death, and general overpopulation, every one of these cultures hit a low point in the 14th or early 15th centuries. What happened then was that every main civilization became culturally conservative to deal with the trauma they had just faced. Islam faced Shia fanaticism and Sunni orthodoxy. India had a conservative Hindu backlash, and China had the conservative ethnic Chinese Ming dynasty seize power. The West, however, went in a diametrically opposite direction. It experienced the artistic and cultural renaissance, the Reformation questioned all the platforms of the Catholic Church, the Age of Exploration showed Europeans most of the world, and this was topped off by the scientific and industrial revolutions. No one's entirely sure why this happened, and there are entire books written on the subject. I have my own personal theories, which would take far too long to explain, but in general, the West's ability to break the rules of history and make a massive leap forward is simply incredible. For almost all of history, all the world's cultures of Eurasia were at the same rough technological level, and to see the West leap this far ahead is jarring. Frankly, society has changed so fast that no one has been able to keep up. I'd be very surprised if this is a common occurrence in history, and if we discover aliens and societies will probably puzzle them endlessly, and they will continue to try to find factors to justify it. What if Altist? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please comment, subscribe, and stay tuned for future content. If you like that, you might like my video on the 10 alternate history cliches I dislike the most. And as always, thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.